We're joined today by Tim Draper, one of the most prominent tech venture capitalists of our generation. Uh, Mr. Draper is the founder of 30 venture capital firms, including uh, Draper Fisher Dravetson. Tim has been an early backer of some of the most influential technologies of the last 30 years, including Hotmail, Skype, Tesla, SpaceX, Twitter, Coinbase, and Robinhood. Mr. Draper, an absolute honor to host you today to talk about Bitcoin, venture capital, and much more. Thank you for being here. Great. Thanks for having me on your show there, David. Tim, let's start with uh, Bitcoin. In 2014, you purchased roughly 29,600 Bitcoins confiscated by U.S. Marshals from the Silk Road project online, uh, marked around $18.7 million at the time, worth about $630 per coin. First of all, do you still hold the majority of those 29,000 Bitcoins or not? Actually, I, yeah, I haven't done anything with those. Um, I bought more. I actually bought a bunch at four when Bitcoin was at four. Um, but I bought them through uh, an intermediary um, through our, our work with, uh, we, we funded CoinLab and I was working with them to do it. And somehow we lost all those Bitcoin. Um, that was about 40,000 Bitcoin uh, to the Silk Road mess. I mean, no, sorry, to the Mao Gox mess. Right. Um, so we lost a bunch of them. And then I realized that there was there was something really valuable here when I thought after Mao Gox had sort of disappeared all the money, um, that that was the end of Bitcoin. But it turns out that there were a lot of people using Bitcoin for a lot of different uses. And, um, and Bitcoin price only dropped about I don't know, fifteen percent on the on the information that their biggest trading partner, Mt. Gox, had basically stolen all the money. So I think it at that point I, I decided I would um, dig in and find out what everybody was using it for, and it was being used for remittances. It was being used by corporates to pay people overseas. It was being used by um, people who were unbanked, uh, allowing them to be a part of the world economy. Uh, it was being used for a lot of great purposes. And so I thought I would just keep buying in. And I did for quite a while. And then um, uh, the auction came up and I thought, well, that's a, there's a bunch of Bitcoin available there. And uh and everyone around me was figuring out what kind of a discount they were going to get to market. And I thought, discount, who cares whether this thing's up 5% or 10% or down 5 or 10% doesn't matter because it's either going to be, you know, the worldwide, the biggest currency of the world, and it's going to completely change everything, or um, it'll go out of business. And uh, and so I, I figured might as well buy in big. And I got all the uh, all nine of the lots the U.S. Marshal's office um, offered up. I, I had only hoped to get one or two. <laughs> so I got more than I thought. But once I got it, I thought, wow, oh, that's pretty great. And it um, Bitcoin went from the 632 I bought it for down to about 180. And I looked pretty stupid, um, but I kind of had this belief that this was really an important um, opportunity for the world, and it really needed, um, it just needed more support. And so I've been giving it support ever since. Well, you've been known throughout your career as a tech entrepreneur, as well as an investor in the tech space. Did you view Bitcoin as a technology primarily? or is a commodity with speculative upside? Neither. I, I looked at, um, I had been looking at digital currencies for a long time. And uh, I thought it would be in game. I thought various games would start trading with each other and that would be the future of currency. Uh, you know, you'd get whatever the gold from Farmville and you'd trade it with the, you know, the diamonds from MISC or something. Um, and, uh, but what happened was Bitcoin showed up and they created a trusted third party, 
Satoshi Nakamoto, created a trusted third party that was better than banks, better than governments, better than banks and governments working together. Um, there would only be 21 million of them. And so that there wouldn't be inflation. Uh, you knew what you owned when you owned one Bitcoin. Uh, they, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain to date has never been hacked. I mean, I appreciate that. And uh, whereas banks get hacked all the time, governments get hacked all the time. I've lost money that was sitting in banks. Um, and, uh, but, but Bitcoin blockchain has not been hacked. So that's really quite exciting. Uh, that changes everything. And, you know, you look around and you see these huge buildings that say Citibank or Chase or JP Morgan or whatever. And, and I go by and I think, you know, that means they're creating huge friction to our economy. Uh, banks and governments with all the regulations uh, have built sort of a cushy existence between the two that's stagnant. And, uh, and I know that when a company is providing or an industry is providing bad service at a high cost because they're a, a, a monopoly or oligopoly, that there's an opportunity for a new entrant and Bitcoin's that new entrant. And so I, I actually think this is really good for society. I think, um, I mean, governments should, should recognize this very actively because you can get your Bitcoin paid automatically, your taxes paid automatically in Bitcoin. So I think there are um, some misconceptions in the press. I think people don't understand it. And uh, and governments should be embracing Bitcoin in a huge way, because if let's say if I could raise a fund all in Bitcoin, invest it all in Bitcoin, have all the entrepreneurs pay their employees and suppliers all in Bitcoin and all taxes paid in Bitcoin, the whole thing could be done on the blockchain and the government wouldn't have to hire 85,000 IRS agents to go hunt people down and try to you know, extort them for, you know, money they they think that they owe them. Um, instead, it would automatically all be done on the blockchain, all in a smart contract. I wouldn't have to pay accountants, lawyers, auditors, bookkeepers, whoever, um, to make sure that all the numbers are right. Uh, it, I would know they were all right because they were kept track of on the blockchain. My investors would always know they were getting the right amount of money because it would it would be built into a smart contract and uh, employees and suppliers would always get paid uh, exactly what they're supposed to get paid because that would be a smart contract. Uh, I think this is it's coming and it's just a matter of time before um, before we get uh, leadership in government that uh, is wise enough to understand this. Do you think there could be or needs to be a price level at which the government, like you said, would start to understand or embrace Bitcoin more? I don't think it has much to do with price. I think it has to do with what, I mean, when you're a government official at best, um, you trust people and you set them free and uh, and then you guide them with, uh, with a, a, the best available way to operate. And uh, of course, the worst governments are the ones that don't trust people and they control people. And they, you know, like President Xi or President Putin, they're just destroying people's lives because they, they think they know better than everybody else what to do uh, and what everybody should do. Uh, no, but the best governments basically trust people and set them free. And in that case, um, the best of governments would uh, it would be embracing Bitcoin, would be encouraging people to use Bitcoin because um, the the amount of friction it would take out of the economy would grow the economy by a much faster rate. And and so it'd be the world would be better off. And so I think we're going to be taking an anthropological leap forward. Um, incidentally, I think AI also uh, gives us an anthropological leap forward. I think 
big project, big new technologies like that, um, it, it tend to scare, um, well, the press likes to scare people because they get paid advertising for the fear, but um, they, they tend to scare uh, people and uh, but they're always better. We're always better off later on. So like the, the internet scared people, but the internet, you know, transformed communications, information, gaming, entertainment, media, internet, taxis, hotels. It's just really been extraordinary. Uh, I think the same will be with Bitcoin. It's going to transform the way we bank, the way we, um, the commerce, finance, all of that. And AI, I think, is going to transform education, uh, the bureaucracy. I think government's going to be better uh, served and do a better job uh, because they can use AI. I mean, AI can be the perfect bureaucrat. I think medicine is going to change with AI. I think you can get better and much cheaper diagnosis and therapeutics uh, with AI. AI is actually going to start doing surgery too. Um, so major things are going to be happening in AI. And, uh, and so I think we as humans are taking big anthropological leaps forward. But every time you have an anthropological leap forward, there is tension. There is, and, and right now we have wars, we have trade barriers, we have all those things. Because the status quo, the governments that currently um, are in control are trying to justify themselves. Think about this. The internet opened up the world. We were all doing trade. I mean, amazing trade between the US and China. Some amazing things were happening. Um, the, the world economy was growing at an unprecedented rate. Uh, the uh, the number of people moving into the middle class was extraordinary from uh, from poverty. Um, smartphones were everywhere. All sorts of great things were happening around the world. Uh, poverty was almost alleviated. And then, um, you know, we had the pandemic and governments started to create sort of paranoia. And they justified their their geographic borders again. They started to fight, started to create barriers where there weren't barriers before. They were saying, you know, to the U in the US, they were saying, don't do business with China. And in, in China, they're saying, don't do business with the free countries. Um, in, uh, and, and that created real um real friction and it slowed down the world economy. World economy is not growing as fast anymore because of these weak leaders who feel like they want it back the way it was. But I look at them as the, the it's the, the roar, the great roar of the dying lion. So people like Putin, people like Xi, they're weak leaders and they're trying to control everybody because they need to justify that they exist. Um, you know, governments are really artificial constructs and, uh, and governance is a service and it should be provided as a service and people should be able to pick and choose the service that they want. It, it isn't, um, a God given right for president Xi to tell 1.4 billion people what they're supposed to have for breakfast or whether they should be locked down during the pandemic when the fire is burning their house down. Um, and, and 300 million people should not be forced to do what uh, President Putin is forcing them to do, is go to war with uh, Ukraine. Um, he's a weak man. He's, he's got a psychological weak problem. And, uh, and he's trying to like, you know, build his ego up by on the on the backs of 300 million people who have to suffer because of it. I think those dying lions are dying soon. I think in the next, I, I think we're going to have to go through it. Um, 
you know, you're seeing the war in, in Israel now, you're seeing um, tension in Taiwan, you're seeing the Ukraine war. And all of those things are, are artificial constructs. The people in Russia don't have a problem with the people in Ukraine. It's just that one guy. I mean, you know, you, if you if it were decentralized instead of a centralized government, you know, Putin would have some angry peeve and he, you know, put him in a cage fight with somebody. And then he'd be happy. You know, it, let him fight head to head with somebody. But instead, he's uh, he's putting 300 million people uh, at risk. Uh, and I so I, I kind of feel like we're on the precipice of this new form of governance, this decentralized govern governance, this governance that is that is peaceful because it's decentralized, and uh, and it's. Uh, and it's not one person who can destroy an economy, destroy uh, people's lives. Um, you know, I mean, and people say, why do you like Bitcoin so much? Well, Bitcoin's decentralized. And they say, what about FTX? And I said, FTX was centralized. FTX, you might as well have a central bank. And it was one guy who decided what would happen with a currency. With Bitcoin, no one person can control Bitcoin. It's it's wide open. It's totally decentralized. And so they can't print more. There are only 25 million. So they can't devalue your currency. Whereas, I mean, I had a bunch of dollars going into this um, pandemic, and then the, the U.S. decided they were going to print $10 trillion. Well, suddenly my dollars are worth 75 cents. They're worth 25 percent less. And it's all because they just decided arbitrarily to print more money. And I got, you know, my money became less valuable. Um, that won't happen with Bitcoin. So I think, yes, Bitcoin matters. It's important. And, uh, and I think people are starting to recognize it yet again. Uh, you know, it got hyped up in 2017, came crashing down. And now they're starting to go, oh, wow. This stuff really does matter. It's really important to us. Is holding Bitcoin then the answer to beating inflation over the long term when you were talking about the devaluation of fiat and then how Bitcoin was perhaps a solution? Is it the solution long term? I think um, Bitcoin is the solution for um, not just inflation, but um, a currency that we can all use. Uh, we can send it anywhere. We can, um, it's decentralized there. You know, the value of it, you know, there are only 21 million of them. Uh, I think, yes, it is a new form of money and it is, it's far better. And yes, it's probably, um, it probably saves people, um, a lot of pain and anguish around inflation. You know, in Argentina, the Argentinian peso you know, it drops somewhere between 20 and 70% every year. And, and if you have a, a currency that drops between 70, 20 and 70% every year, it's a hot potato. You don't want to hold it very long. It's like, whoa, let's get rid of it. So the people in Argentina really understand Bitcoin and they are all over it. Same thing with Nigeria, uh, Venezuela, all the places where currencies are not really well respected uh, and where governments are, uh, are are just printing them as they feel like it, as they, they just decide they want to create more money for themselves. So, uh, so yes, it, it's not just a hedge for inflation. I think it's, it, it solves inflation permanently. And, and suddenly, you know, you can have a very smooth growth global economy as you build it on Bitcoin. So really exciting times. It's going to be fantastic. But people who are who are uh, entrenched with fiat currencies, they are not going to like this. And you can tell even people who are some of the richest people in the world who have a lot of dollars are not liking Bitcoin because they're saying, wait, no, 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 use my currency. But 
my guess is by the time, and it won't be long before I can buy my food, my clothing, my shelter all in Bitcoin, uh, oh. and I can pay my taxes in Bitcoin. At that point, there's going to be no reason to have fiat currency. And people will, it'll be like having Confederate dollars. Uh, they're worthless. Why, why would you use your Bitcoin to buy groceries if you believe it has long-term upside potential? Why not use a stable coin, for example, that's tethered to uh, a fiat currency? Yeah, you would for a while, but at some point you'd run out of fiat currency and you just decide, hey, I want to work in Bitcoin. And there will be a point where, I mean, I think it, at some point, Bitcoin is, uh, I mean, there is an asymptote to the price of Bitcoin, probably $10 million, might be a little higher, um, but that's the asymptote. So there is a point at which um, I, I would probably use my Bitcoin to invest before I'd use it to spend, but uh, I would, uh, and I'm hoping to be able to do that. And really it's just a matter of, you know, the U.S. government catching up with the El Salvador government. They just have to understand it. Fortunately, the El Salvador government understands it. And boy, I, every time I talk to these people from El Salvador, I'm jealous. They're talking about you know what they've done with smart contracts. It's, it's incredibly innovative. Now, when you're picking companies to invest in um, from a VC side, does a particular company's uh, relationship with Bitcoin affect your decision-making criteria? For example, uh, when Tesla and SpaceX added Bitcoins to their treasuries, later they sold them off. But initially, what was your impression? How did you feel about a company adding Bitcoin to its balance sheet? I liked it. I thought it was forward thinking. Um, then Elon, I guess, bought some Dogecoin, just decided that he wanted everybody to Pay Dogecoin for his for his cars, but um, I think their initial reaction was the right one. Uh, does it affect my decision? I I am investing in a bunch of these layer two uh, Bitcoin companies, the ordinal companies, the you know new forms of insurance around Bitcoin, new. Um, accounting systems for bitcoin that kind of thing i'm definitely doing that but we also invest in um, neural networks all sorts of forms of artificial intelligence where you're using artificial intelligence to transform some of these big industries uh, we're investing in uh, a lot of new uh, data driven healthcare companies and uh and then a lot of space companies um, space and transportation seem to be exploding. And I, I give Elon Musk the credit for that. Uh, he, he really broke a log jam and uh, unleashed a bunch of creativity around transportation and space. Uh, speaking of AI, what do you think are the most transformative applications of AI today? You mentioned earlier healthcare, for example, you brought up the possibility of AI performing surgery uh, what else would really catch your attention? So here's the thing with AI. Um, I've been uh, working in AI, I studied AI when I was at Stanford. Um, and it was a, um, at that time, it was all about expert systems. It was like, you, you train the computer to move the pen from here to here, here to here, here to here. Or, or maybe, maybe you add a little something and it trains it. But a neural network so different and so much better. The idea of just taking a ton of data out there and having the AI identify that this is a pen and it can be used in these ways, that's a much bigger opportunity. And so I think you're, you're gonna have, um, and, and with ChatGPT, what we've, what we've captured is the knowledge and power and, and uh, intelligence of everyone around the world. It's all in one place. 
So we, you need an expert. You just hit chat GPT and you get the expert. It's amazing. So I actually think that that, um, you know, we never really backed any robotics companies, but I think it changed uh, and it, they haven't really panned out for anybody yet in the venture business. But I think now might be the time as we switch from expert systems in AI to neural networks, the robots are going to start getting more and more intelligent and they're going to learn as they go and they're going to be strong, stronger uh, intellectually and they're going to be able to make better decisions and they're going to be able to identify this as a pen and I need to pick it up. So I think we've got um, that. I think we got a major breakthrough there. And that's uh, robots could mean, could mean toys, could mean, um, or, you know, you get a doll with AI in it. Boy, that's pretty deal, a pretty good deal. Are you um, concerned about government regulations around <clears throat> AI in the future? Are you concerned about waking up one day reading a headline saying the U.S. government is now banning certain robots in certain industries? Could that happen? You know, it's it's weak leaders that try to control people. It's and I think um, I think we're you know as a group we're smarter than that. Um, Bill Clinton was was a very good leader and he um he tended to trust people and let them roll and he, when people were saying you know ban the internet tax the internet regulate the internet he 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 went hands off and we all benefited in such a huge way all because he he had hands off now he he slapped down cloning, and I I think that was a mistake, um, and I think we would have made much more progress in stem cell re research if he had not slapped down cloning the day Dolly was born. Um, Dolly was a sheep that was cloned, uh, but I think we need um, good strong leaders, and I think with Nikki Haley who I am supporting big. She is a very strong leader. She trusts people. She's going to set them free. Uh, we're going to be much more creative society, but the economy can grow much faster when it's a creative society. Uh, economies go flatline when pe when the leader tries to control everybody as, as evidenced by what's happened in China since she took over. Um, weak leaders flatline economies. Strong leaders grow economies. I mean, you could grow an economy at 8%. China did under Deng Xiaoping and, and the other leaders that they had there. So yes, there is always some pessimist, whiner, whatever, who's worried about the, the edge case where a robot falls off a cliff or does something and, and it hurts somebody or whatever. But we're going to all love having robots around. They're going to do all those things that people don't want to do. And they're going to do them without complaining 24-7. Um, that's going to be a, amazing. It's going to be great. It's just going to be like, you know, we used to, you know, be concerned that the phone was going to be too big a part of our lives. My God, I can't get, I can't get along without my phone. I don't think I, in 10 years I'm going to be able to get along without my robot. Yeah, two follow-ups on that. The first is that, do you personally believe there are applications that should not be put into practice? For example, Elon Musk has said that he doesn't think AI should be integrated with weapons in the military. Is that a view that you share? No, I think in, <clears throat> I mean, in military, you, you're you trying, I mean, if there is military, I actually think if we have a decentralized world, we're not going to have to have these land-based wars anymore. So I'm hoping there's no military down the road. What I mean, what's the point? Um, because we're all a part of this world, and you know, we're if we're all a part of the world, uh, it's like shooting yourself in the foot. But if you are at war, I would think you would want to use every weapon at your disposal, and uh, an AI would be a fabulous one. Okay. Um, the second follow-up I have is in regards to jobs. 
a lot of people are concerned. I think one of the fears, Tim, around AI is the prospect of losing your job to a robot. Goldman Sachs, for example, has projected that in the coming decades, up to 300 million jobs globally could be placed by AI. Now, is that a concern for you from an economic standpoint? And about 400 million will be um, created by AI. I mean, the, that's that's the that's the great thing about humans is they they adapt. They look and they go, oh, oh, so AI can take this job or it can do this thing for me. So my job gets that much more interesting. Um, I have noticed that it's very difficult to get people to, you know, want you know take jobs that are gardening jobs or uh, or flipping burgers jobs or uh, jobs being a, a, a cleaner, a house cleaner, or, or the, they they don't want to do their, or pick and pack jobs. There are a lot of people that don't want those jobs. And now, like, if you, um, if you're, if you're a welder, you are so sought after. Right now, you cannot, pe people cannot hire welders. There are no welders out there to, to work. And there's a lot of demand for them but they don't want that job. Well, that's a job that a robot can take. And if a robot does the welding, then the people can have more abstract jobs that are less physical, labor, enduring, less dangerous. Um, I think you've got a major opportunity for humans to get jobs. It, to have jobs that are much safer because the robots will take the harder work. Um, besides AI, is there another technology that you're eyeing that you think could be disruptive or transformative for humans uh, all around the world that you would potentially invest in? Yeah, I am investing. Um, it, it's um, it's this new new technology around healthcare, and it's not just data and AI in healthcare, you know, the computational biochemistry that that allows the therapeutics to go specifically to you, to your issue. Um, that I think that's very powerful. So that that personalized bespoke medicine, I think it's going to be a big deal. But uh, CRISPR and stem cell research, all sorts of cell research are are creating cures and and they're not therapies they're cures they're one shot and you are cured and the drug companies are not going to like these and the fda is just starting to approve a few of these cures and that's going to change the whole nature of medicine and i i love the idea of backing these companies because i actually think uh the the drug companies are now um, a an oligopoly providing bad service at a high cost. And the, the proof there is that the costs keep going up, but the um, last decade was the first decade that Americans didn't live as long as they did the, the decade before. So they're clearly not doing a good job. They are failing. And um, new companies that come up with cures, the cures are going to be one shot and they're going to be um, a, 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 you know, a, a very expensive, but one time. And then, you know, these, some kid who has to go and get blood transfusions every week or whatever, no longer has to do that. And that changes everything in healthcare. Um, and I think there will be a lot of money made in those fields as, and hopefully that means that, uh, that the, the big pharma companies, uh, either collapse under their own weight or they adjust and they start providing cures too. I'm just curious, um, how you allocate your capital. Uh, in the VC space, do you have a rule, which is that maybe I'm going to allocate a certain percentage of my total uh, uh, wealth or funds in a certain sector, uh, or do you assess each company on a company to uh, peer to peer basis in terms of risk? Um, you know, let's say if you had a billion dollars, how would you divide that up? 
I would put 100% of it behind the best entrepreneurs in the world going after the biggest markets in the world with the best technologies in the world. That's it. That's where I go. Um, and there is no other allocation because I do seed investing. I mean, I seed it. I was the first money into Tesla. First, first money other than Elon's into SpaceX. First money into, into uh, Hotmail, into Skype. First money into Baidu. Um, now we were set, we were first institutional money into, into Baidu. Um, we go in very early. So we're we're investing in, you know, a guy, a girl, and a cat. And they're going up against Microsoft or Google. They're going up against big, huge, uh, enormous businesses with millions of potential, hundreds of thousands or millions of people working for them. So a lot can go wrong, but um, but if it works, it's a big deal. And and so we're always looking for those interesting entrepreneurs that might have that exceptional capability to navigate, um, you know, and what it turns out to be a 15 year project to, uh, to accomplish something that no one thinks they can. Uh, well, you said as invest in the best entrepreneurs. Uh, let's just take Elon, for example. Uh, why did you invest in, I'm not going to say SpaceX or Tesla, why did you invest in Elon? Uh, was it his previous track record with PayPal or other companies before Tesla? Was it something about him that you liked? We tried to back uh, the precursor to PayPal before, but we got outbid. Um, and yes, he's, he's extraordinary. And Part of it is that he had this love for the customer. He has this, uh, this uh, he, he always wanted to delight the customer. And, uh, and that was true uh, of Nicholas Zenstrom at Skype. That was true of Robin Lee at Baidu. They all came to us and, and the word customer came up a lot in each of those meetings. And a delighting of the customer came up with each of them. So if a company is setting out to make a lot of money, that doesn't do it. If a company is setting out to prove some new technology, that doesn't do it. But if a company is setting out to delight a customer or a group of customers, that's a winner. As a startup founder myself, my next question may be, self-serving. Can you give us some advice in terms of starting a business today in any field? Um, I mean, you know, I'm in media, but you're mostly in tech and other things. But um, for somebody starting a business in 2023, uh, what should they avoid? What should they look for? What should they do? I think um, incorporate the best and brightest technologies in there as uh, much as you possibly can. So uh, if you can AI a part of your job, do it. If you can incorporate Bitcoin, smart contracts, blockchain into your business, do it. If you can create ordinals in your business, do it. I, if if you um, you know if you're in healthcare, uh, you know make sure that uh, you're using big data and deep learning. I think that's really important. Uh, so that would be number one. It's like really understand all the technology and incorporate it into your business. Second is just love your customer and do what you can for your customer. And you might have two-sided equation. We do. Venture capitalists, we have to love the entrepreneur. We have to love our limited partners. And, um, and we have to figure out how to delight both sides. And a lot of and uh, a lot of people in media need to do the same thing. Um, Distribution is very important. Uh, you know, I I came up with the the viral marketing idea way back when with Hotmail. And if you can make your customers into your sales force, uh, people are so delighted by what they do with you that as customers that they have to tell everybody else about it. Um, 
try to make that happen. Um, make sure you make money, make money, make lots of money because uh, you're not doing anybody any favors. In fact, you become part of the problem if you're not making money. And But if you are making money, you can spread the word much wider and broader than you ever um, thought about. So um, yeah, those would be some of my my top pieces of advice. Um, final question on VCs. The common... And hire, that well. start a hire good people and uh, and keep them. Yes, yes, sure. Uh, the, the most startups fail within two years, as you know. The, the common, uh, obviously, every industry, every company is different, but the common mistakes you see people make within the 21st, 24 to 48 months that have led to failure, what, what are they? They're almost all people issues. You think they're money issues. They're almost all people issues. It's like two people who both want to be the... CEO, or two people that both want to be the CTO, you know, trying to, one guy trying to tell the engineer what to do. Um, that's usually the problem. It, it, I mean, sometimes it's like dating co-founders who break up and that destroys the company. Um, but uh, the other thing is, it, something I noticed in the bull market was um, what we've <laughs> we come up with a term for it is the entrepreneurial tourists, um, the people who just wanted to start a business to start a business. Uh, that was not that's not enough. You have to feel it in your bones. You have to feel it in your heart. It's got to be, you know, this is the most important thing in your life. Uh, you know, maybe family first, uh, but this has got to be the most, you know, one of the top two most important things of your life uh, if you are going to build a business because you're up against 100,000 people. So how, how are you going to work your way into that? And you've got to have an edge. Uh, you got to have a reason that a customer is going to go to you instead of those other hundred thousand people that are in your industry working for somebody else. Well, well thank you for that. It's not uh, every day a startup founder gets to ask advice from a billionaire venture capitalist who's, who's made it. So I appreciate that. Uh, finally, I want to close off on uh, Nikki Haley. You've been a vocal supporter advocate of Nikki Haley. You talked about weak leadership all over the world. Why, in your opinion, is Nikki Haley not well, she's going strong to be leadership. A, a leak? Yeah, why is she not a weak leader? She's a strong leader. Nikki Haley is strong. She is um, decisive. She is thoughtful. She comes up. Uh, she's she's delightful. She's wonderful in person. She. Um, she has a strong backbone. When the the world was losing its mind and thought, oh, maybe we should all become socialists, she stood up and said, no, capitalism is good. She wrote an uh, article in the Wall Street Journal saying, saying uh, you know, I'm hearing a lot of this about socialism, but capitalism is so much better as a system. It, it creates wealth, jobs, uh, creates, builds more creativity in people, happier people. Uh, she, she, so she understands the economy. She understands freedom. She understands free markets. She understands how important free speech is. She understands how the government can get in the way of progress. And, and currently it's getting in the way all over the place. Um, and I think she's, um, Oh, it's all also time for a woman. And it's great because she'll be coming in at a time when some of these very um, weak leaders, the the she, President Xi, President Putin, are are trying to like flex muscles that they shouldn't even have. Um, and they're uh, and they're sort of showing how macho they are. I think it's just awesome for a woman to come in there. I think she will. I think she's going to domestically, I think she's going to be amazing because she's going to create more freedoms, more, uh, 
uh, more openness, uh, a healthier environment, all of those things. And uh, globally, I think she's going to be a, you know, terrific to work with. I think every leader is just going to go, oh, wow, yeah, whatever you want, Nikki. And I think she's going to be, I, I think we are so lucky she's running. And boy, I hope, you know, boy, I hope she, uh, when she's president, um, the, the, the press allows her brilliance to shine. You know, because sometimes the press just goes right after somebody's gut when they the day they win. Um, I think the press should understand that they are just lucky to have her. What's her relationship or attitude towards digital currencies, bitcoins, cryptos, uh, even CBDCs? I think she she believes in free markets, so uh, you know I think that's a win. Yeah, I think that's a win for for uh, cryptocurrencies, for, um, I don't think she's going to feel like she has to create a CBDC. I don't think she's going to, I don't think she's going to feel like she has to, hey, they're already out there. There are plenty of things tied to the dollar. You don't need more. And you certainly don't need one built by the government. Remember when the government built that software for, for healthcare? It was a disaster. <laughs> uh, Mr. Draper, this has been a fascinating discussion. I thank you very much for educating us and giving us your time. Where can we learn more about uh, Draper Associates and your current ventures and your current work? Well, um, if you're an entrepreneur and you have a business plan, I'm Tim at Draper.vc. Um, also, always interested in talking to investors. Um, and if you're um, if you want to follow me, it's at Tim Draper on Twitter. And uh, we have um, if you are an entrepreneur and you're saying, "Hey, I, I think I need a a little bit of a lightning strike," um, I recommend uh, Draper University. It teaches people. Um, not the skills, but the emotional strength to become an entrepreneur. And I recommend going to meet the Drapers and watch our show. It's hilarious. It's so much fun. Where can we watch that show? Oh, um, you can go to Draper TV or um, it's on YouTube also, if that makes it easier. And we have 70 million viewers around the world. Very exciting um, that it's so popular because when I first started, I, I had to sort of beg my mother to watch. Um, and now it's like huge. And we interview these amazing entrepreneurs and we have these guest judges that are extraordinary. So um, top top of the heap guest judges and, uh, and some entrepreneurs that are um, filtered, you know, I mean, a thousand entrepreneurs apply to be on the show for every four we put on. So uh, you're you're seeing really good quality. We'll put the links down in the description. Make sure to check that out. I'm just curious. Uh, you mentioned Draper University. You, you, you don't just teach technical skills, but also emotional uh, skills. How will somebody become a better person after attending the lectures and the courses? Presumably these emotional qualities are transferable skills to other areas in life. We have found that um, people who go through Draper University have um, have really accelerated beyond their peers. Uh, even if they join a big company, they seem to be promoted and promoted and promoted faster than anybody around them. Um, when they go back to academia, uh, you know, either they get straight A's or they get or they flunk out because their startup is starting to take off. Um, we've had about 4,000 students through and a thousand have started businesses and, uh, five are unicorns already. And we're only like 12 years old. Uh, what we're really doing is we called it Draper University of Heroes. And what we're really doing is taking ordinary people and turning them into heroes. The final question, I'll let you go. One word to describe 
what makes a successful founder into a CEO, into a unicorn? What's one characteristic that they have? You know, a lot of things come to mind, but I, it's probably a North Star. It's probably a vision of a better future that everybody around them understands that they're after and wants to help them. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mr. Draper. Appreciate it. Great. Good interview. Thanks, David.